Quintus Caecilius Metellus Numidicus, Consul 109 BCE, Censor 102 BCE. At various points in his political prime, Metellus ranged between being the first and the third man in Rome. First among the senators aligned against King Jugurtha, he was the third consul sent to conquer the slippery Numidian king. On the verge of finishing Jugurtha as proconsul and becoming the first man in Rome, he was ousted by his former friend and consular successor, Gaius Marius. Back in Rome, as Marius rose to dizzying heights at the expense of the prestige of the senatorial oligarchy, Metellus was for several years first among the faction later called the Optimates, those aristocratic conservatives in the Senate who zealously and jealously defended the perquisites they had claimed since the Second Punic War. After failing to expel some of Marius's chief adherents from the Senate while serving as censor, Metellus chose exile over pledging an oath to uphold the legislation of his enemies. Upon his return from exile, he was first in virtue in the eyes of many, but his lack of interest in public affairs saw him while away the decade of the 90s until he died quietly in 91, the third man of a political era dominated by Marius and Sulla. This is the story of Metellus Numidicus. Quintus Metellus was the scion of one of the better known and more established families among the plebeian aristocracy. He grew up with the expectation that one day he, like his father and other ancestors, would serve as consul and bring further honor and distinction to his family name. Quintus's father was Lucius Caecilius Metellus Calvus, who served as consul in 142 and was given the unenviable task of tackling Viriathus' revolt in Hispania. Later, Lucius was also tasked with serving as the proconsular governor of Cisalpine Gaul. Viriathus' revolt was also a long-term commitment for the Romans to deal with, and in some ways you could compare Viriathus' revolt with the war against Jugurtha. Both were wily opponents who did much to utilize local support and the terrain, to frustrate the Romans and embarrass a series of commanders. Lucius Metellus does not seem to have done super well against Viriathus, however, he was not disgraced in any way at all either. Quintus's older brother, Lucius Caecilius Metellus Dalmaticus, served as consul in 119 and while serving as consul did quite well for himself earning a cognomen for his actions in Dalmatia. He was later elected Pontifex Maximus, and he served in that capacity from 114 until 103. Interestingly enough, we know very little about Quintus's brother Lucius, despite the fact that he was clearly a highly accomplished Roman from this period. When Quintus was young, he went to Athens to study under the renowned academic skeptic Carneades. When he returned, he was a cultured and remarkably eloquent man. One also suspects, given his later actions, that he also spent a great deal of time studying and thinking about ethics. The consensus seems to be that Quintus Metellus was born around the year 160, which would have made him about 50 years old at the time of his election to consul in 109. However, given that he was of high aristocratic birth, I'm of the belief that he was actually born closer to 151 BCE and that 109 was what the Roman ruling class called his year, that is the year when he met the minimum age requirement for the consulship, the age 42. Nothing in his record contradicts this, so I think that this better fits the evidence. My belief is that a lot of scholars want to put him around the year 160 because that makes him older than Gaius Marius, a guy whose career he was supporting at this time, However, there is no known rule that someone had to be older than someone they're supporting if that person is of a somewhat lower class. And also, Metellus had a well-placed father and older brother, and he could have simply inherited Marius' service as legate that way. So there's no reason to suspect that he had taken Marius under his wing as a teenager or anything like that. Metellus served as keister in 126. He was tribune in 121. He was an edile in 118, he was a praetor in 115, 
and after his praetorship, he was the pro-Praetorian governor of Sicily in 114. Apparently, he had some friction with the locals in Sicily. After his tenure as governor ended, Metellus was accused of extortion by a Sicilian delegation which traveled to Rome to uh, go in front of the extortion court and try Metellus. The court usually would hold a hearing, but they typically dismissed charges against governors because governors came from their own class, and unless the person being judged was a personal political enemy, there was usually not much incentive for the senators to find fault in what a governor did. After all, being governor could be quite a lucrative job if you went there and find your pockets just a little bit. When the judges heard that Metellus was being brought before them for thievery, they laughed and thought that the charges were so absurd that they couldn't possibly be true and that it would be a waste of everyone's time and an insult to his high character to even hold the trial in the first place. The charges were dismissed without examination, which was pretty unusual. Typically, the Romans liked to at least pretend that they governed justly and lawfully, but in this case, they simply used their own judgment and told the Sicilians that they must be mistaken. It's safe to say that already by this point, Metellus was one of the group of men who would later be called the Optimates or the Boni. The Optimates means the best men, the Boni means the good men. Both terms effectively actually mean the same thing. It refers to those men whose ancestors had held consulships and who thought that it was their right to inherit power in the Roman world. By the time that he had been elected consul in 109, Metellus was one of, if not the leading figures in the aristocratic faction. Despite the fact that he was not the most senior senator and not even the most senior member of his own family, we have to remember that, again, the rules about who was most prestigious were not set in stone. While the Romans typically did favor age and experience over all else, later, from about 63 forward, Cato the Younger, who never held the consulship and was significantly younger than many of his colleagues, was the most influential Roman conservative. So, again, the rules are not hard and fast, and there's quite a bit of play in terms of who is the most influential member or the leader of a faction. The Juggerthine War was one of the most embarrassing episodes in the history of the Roman Republic as it showed the avarice which had really set in among the Roman senators. Metellus had been a long advocate of getting rid of Jugurtha and doing the right thing by Jugurtha's nephews. In 116 or thereabouts, Jugurtha, who had been sharing power with his two nephews, decided to murder one and force the other to flee to Rome. Ostensibly, the two nephews were under the protection of Rome. However, the Roman Senate failed to act on their behalf because Jugurtha had friends in high places and he used judiciously placed bribes in order to win the support of other senators. Supposedly, things were bad enough that even the Princep Senatus himself was subject to this bribery. Later on, when the Senate was finally shamed into holding Jugurtha accountable and sending a consul to deal with the rogue Numidian ruler, the war then turned into a source of embarrassment and became a kind of graveyard for the careers of Roman consuls. Lucius Calpurnius Bestia, in the year 111, pushed Jugurtha to the breaking point, and when he was on the verge of victory, decided instead to take a heavy bribe in order to accept a negotiated surrender and depart. He was then condemned in Rome. Spurius Posthumius Albinus in 110, a consul who seems to have been inept more so than corrupt, took his army back to Africa, and he seems to have also been willing to listen to Jugurtha's false promises that he was on the verge of surrender. This was an embarrassing campaign which caused even Spurius' younger brother to lose faith in his leadership. When Spurius had to return to Rome in order to conduct an election or something of that nature, his brother Aulus was in charge and he was determined to deal with Jugurtha himself. He marched right into a trap. His army was captured and forced to go under the yoke. 
Later on, Spurius returns to Africa and tries to restore order, but the troops won't listen. So then when his term of office is finally officially over, he goes back to Rome, and he, too, is condemned and executed for his actions against Jugurtha, the suspicion being that he was on the take from the Numidian king. This is the war that Metellus had wanted. He had long been an advocate of holding Jugurtha accountable, and he was one of the guys crying out most loudly for the executions of Bestia and Spurius Albinus. So, now was his chance. Quick programming note, for those of you who are interested in learning more about the Princeps Senatus Marcus Aemilius Scaurus, or Bestia, or Spurius Albinus, good news, I have videos about all of those guys on this channel, which I've already uploaded. There's also another video on Aulus Posthumius Albinus, and I think that one actually might be the most interesting of the lot. Anyway, enough plugging my old material, let's get back into Metellus Numidicus. The election of 109 seems like it was custom made for Metellus. He was the perfect fit for the task ahead. In the eyes of the Roman Senate, which had just condemned two consuls back-to-back -back years, they thought what they needed was a consul dedicated to winning the war. And it was hard to find someone who had been a more vociferous advocate of killing Jugurtha and avenging the murder of one of his nephews. Metellus's willingness to conquer Numidia was not in question, and the Romans never doubted the military ability of their army to deal with the Numidians. In addition to strong support from the majority of the Senate, Metellus's stance on Jugurtha was very popular with the people of Rome who at this point were disgusted and embarrassed by the greed of the Roman elite, who were letting themselves get effectively manipulated by a foreign king. Metellus's patrician colleague that year was Marcus Junius Silanus. However, I don't think there was much real doubt as to who would get the command. Sure, in theory, commands were allotted by the lot, which was supposed to be the will of the gods, but given the situation, it would not surprise me to learn if, say, the Pontifex Maximus, who happened to be Metellus's brother, may have had a set interpretation of the signs that the gods gave. Metellus had heard rumors that the army in Africa, which had served under Spurius Albinus, was not in very good shape, so before departing for Africa, he made sure to levy fresh men whose valor he could count on, and he also made extensive preparations to ensure adequate provisions since he intended to drive into the heart of Numidian territory in order to bring Jugurtha to justice and avenge the humiliation of Spurius Albinus's troops being forced to march under the yoke. When he arrived in Africa and assumed command, he learned that his preparations had been quite wise as Spurius Albinus had been completely unable to restore discipline. Camps were unfortified, watches weren't being kept, men were wandering around and trying to trade their wine, their food for wine, and when the locals weren't giving them their wine, they would just take it. So the Romans were alienating their own subjects in the Roman province of Africa and really just not doing anything productive whatsoever. Metellus's first task, therefore, was to whip his army back into shape and integrate his new troops with the recently disgraced troops who were already on the field. He marched his army around enforcing discipline and making the army drill, march, and encamp in order to get them reaccustomed to soldiering. While he was doing all this, as we'll see, he also was working his diplomatic game. His two leading legates in this campaign were Gaius Marius, who was already a highly experienced soldier, and Publius Rutilius Rufus, who would serve as consul a few years down the line. It would appear that early on in 109, both Metellus and Jugurtha were looking for a simple and quick diplomatic solution. Metellus, while he was marching his army around and getting them back in the fighting shape, was spending a lot of his free time in his tent talking with Jugurtha's envoys. Jugurtha was essentially trying to win him over with the old tricks of promising rewards or saying that he was in the process of getting ready to surrender, 
Metellus knew that both of these were lies, but he did feign some interest in order to keep the envoys in camp. Meanwhile, he was trying to subvert the loyalty of the envoys and also gather intelligence on what Jugurtha was up to and try to find some people who might be willing to betray their king. When Metellus crossed the border with his army, he was on high alert. Although the Numidians did not offer any defense at the border, he thought that they might be lurking just around the bend and ready to strike. So he himself led from the front with the light troops. He had the auxiliary cavalry on the wings, and he left Marius with the Roman cavalry in the rear guard. The Numidian populace was welcoming, and when Metellus arrived at the city of Vaga, the largest commercial center in Numidia, the populace welcomed him with open arms and surrendered without a fight. Metellus installed a garrison and continued into the hinterlands of Numidia. When he saw that Metellus was not interested in reaching a diplomatic settlement and realized that he had given up his largest city for nothing, Jugurtha resolved to fight a decisive battle before Metellus occupied and garrisoned more of his territory. His army was fairly good, but it was outnumbered, so Jugurtha chose his site carefully. He situated himself along a defensive position on the near bank of the Muthal River. This was a great site since it was the first source of water after 18 miles of desert terrain. Since Metellus was following him, he knew that Metellus would cross through this area and his men would be thirsty when they arrived to fight, whereas his men would have time to drink from the river before the fighting began. He also set up an ambush, which he thought would give him the advantage and allow his smaller force to offset the larger and more heavily armed Romans. However, Metellus did scouting in person. He was a very upfront and active commander, and he was able to detect the ambush through his scouts and altered his formation accordingly. However, the Numidian infantry in the area controlled high ground, and this made it difficult for the Romans to simply move forward without exposing their flank. So what ended up happening is a kind of running battle with the Numidian cavalry using their speed for hit-and-run attacks with javelins and other projectiles. Rutilius and his light troops were sent to secure a camp along the river because Metellus knew that the fight was going to be a long one and his men would need easy access to water lest they die of thirst while in the middle of a battle in the heat of the desert summer. At the Muthal, as in all of his battles, Metellus showed himself to be every inch a Roman. He was brave and he led from the front. However, he was not a military genius, and in both of the battles where he fought alongside Marius, he was outshone by a considerable amount. The Muthal is the first example. Metellus was effectively pinned down in the front, and this led to Marius having to lead in the reserves in order to rescue Metellus's unit. And then before the Numidians could recover and restore the balance of holding the Romans in check, Metellus took the reserves and charged uphill against the Numidian infantry. After seizing the hill, Marius was then able to order the cavalry into the rear of the vaunted Numidian cav and force them to quit the field. This effectively won the day, however, the Romans still could have been mauled in this battle. On a somewhat separate part of the field, where Rutilius's men had been located, they had effectively cut themselves off from the rest of the Romans, and Jugurtha had tried to capitalize by sending his general Bomilcar with the 40 or so war elephants that they had to overrun these Romans and then prevent the rest of the Romans from getting water. However, Bomilcar apparently was not very adept at handling elephants, so he tried to lead them through a patch of woods in order to gain some surprise. The elephants got stuck in the trees, and then Rutilius was able to think quickly, counterattack, and capture the elephants while killing their riders. At the Battle of the Muthal, the Romans suffered heavier losses. However, they had technically won the day, and they had also won under some rather difficult circumstances since they had just marched through 18 miles of desert, and since they had no easy access to water. What they also showed is that unlike the previous Roman armies, which had 
been commissioned to fight in Numidia. They had the resolve to achieve final victory, and Jugurtha would not be able to buy his way out of a final defeat. Despite the fact that it was a close-run thing and that he had suffered more casualties than his Numidian opponent, Metellus felt fairly confident after the Battle of the Muthal that he was on the verge of victory and that the war was nearly won. He had some pretty good reasons for feeling that confident. After the battle, he decided to spend the next five days tending to the wounded and giving his men time to recover. Back in Rome, the Senate was elated at news of the victory. This was the kind of news they had been waiting for for about three years at this point, but instead they had only been getting distressing reports of incompetence and malfeasance. Metellus succeeding where so many others had failed made him a hero, and for the rest of his life he was seen as a sort of savior figure by the members of his political faction. Here was the real kicker for Jugurtha. Most of his best men had managed to escape the battle. However, because the battle was a rout, there was a Numidian custom where the men who survived the rout were not obligated to go back under the banner of their king after a rout. So the men basically were able to take the rest of this campaigning season off due to this custom. While Jugurtha's cavalry had retreated in good order, and these were sort of his most personal and close followers, he now had to rebuild his army effectively from this little core, which means that the quality of his men would now decline as well as their quantity. So Metellus, if he knew this, and he probably did, had good reason to feel confident. Jugurtha no longer trusted his infantry to be able to do things like hold hills, so now he was forced to resort to guerrilla tactics and sticking with his cavalry almost exclusively. A lot of Numidian towns also thought that the jig was up after the failure of the Muthal plan. A good number of Numidian towns decided to send hostages to Metellus and requested garrisons. Metellus, obviously, was really heartened by these actions and thought that he was on the verge of becoming Metellus Numidicus. Now that his army was rested, Metellus crossed the Muthal and he divided his army into two columns, one under himself and the other under Gaius Marius. These two columns were close to each other and they effectively moved forward to forage in force. The hope being that Jugurtha would try to catch one of them by surprise initiate an open battle, and then these other column could come in as reinforcements, and they could force Jugurtha into a field battle, which he probably wouldn't be able to win given the composition of his army at this time. However, both of them fought fairly carefully, especially Marius, so Jugurtha had trouble finding an easy opening to strike either force, and had to content himself with things like burning grass to deprive the Romans of forage, poisoning springs, how effective that was is unstated by Sallust, and also skirmishing with foragers without letting these develop into full-scale battles. Metellus decided that rather than simply ravaging the countryside, he should instead strike at a major city in order to really make Jugurtha feel the pain and also perhaps draw him out to a major battle. Metellus decided, therefore, to attack the city of Zama a city in eastern Numidia, and the site of the great battle between Hannibal and Scipio Africanus in 202. Jugurtha, however, was well informed of Metellus's intentions, so he reached the area first and set up. He put provisions in the city to make sure that it wouldn't fall, and he also installed the Romans who had deserted to him as part of the garrison, since he knew that they could not surrender to the Romans without being put to death immediately. He promised that when the time was right, he would arrive with his army and bail them out. I assume most of these Roman deserters were from the army of Albinus. However, it's also possible that some of these guys deserted from Metellus' army, but most likely these were guys from a year before. On the way to Zama, Marius was dispatched with a few cohorts in order to pick up grain from the city of Sica, and Jugurtha decided to try to take out this detachment. However, Marius thought quickly, and while the locals were in on 
Jugurtha's plot and plan to attack the Romans from behind and then trap them in the city with the Numidians pouring through the gates. Marius detected the danger and instead charged out of the gates and then routed the Numidians and escaped the locals. So Marius once again came out smelling like roses and proved that he was a highly capable commander. Jugurtha lost his opportunity for a quick and easy victory and the war continued. A quick note about the city of Zama. It was on a flat open plain, so it was not naturally defensible. However, the Numidians had erected strong fortifications, and the garrison, due to Jugurtha's actions, was both strong and had plentiful provisions. As I mentioned earlier, a number of Roman deserters were in the garrison, so they could be expected to fight fiercely since they had no chance whatsoever of receiving quarter. When he didn't spot Jugurtha nearby as he approached the city, Metellus thought that he had stolen a march on Jugurtha and therefore committed his entire army to attack along the whole circuit of the city walls to quickly seize the city before Jugurtha could arrive. He entrusted different sections of the wall to his different legates and gave them quite a bit of leeway when it came to having the ability to make decisions about when to assault, how to press, etc. I suppose this was in recognition of the seniority and talent of men such as Marius and Rutilius Rufus. Jugurtha waited until the assault was underway before he made his move against the Roman camp to the rear. When he arrived at the camp, something unusual happened. Most of the men there were taken by surprise and they panicked. A lot of them also even fled from the camp, which was highly unusual, and only 40 men stood their ground and defended this camp with its fortified rampart and standardized layout. The Roman camp was generally considered impregnable, and in all of Roman history up to this point, the fortified camp had never been overrun by a foreign foe. Today was a day when this seemed quite likely, due to the unexpected panic of Metellus's men in the rear echelon. When the attack on the camp broke out, Metellus was unaware as he was in the middle of organizing an assault against the walls of Zama. Some of the men who had fled the camp ran up to the consul and informed him that the camp was being overrun. Rather than going in person to save his camp, Metellus instead dispatched Marius with infantry and cavalry in order to defend the camp. He also exhorted Marius in the name of the Republic and their friendship to do everything in his power to save their camp, which probably held all their valuables and their provisions. And Marius, of course, was a capable soldier and did exactly as ordered. Marius arrived just in the nick of time to save the camp. This handful of Romans who had stood their ground had survived long enough to allow for reinforcements to bail them out. They were able to use their knowledge of the camp's interior layout to great effect. The Numidians, for their part, had never been in the Roman camp, so they were a bit disoriented, and that little bit of disorientation was just enough of an advantage to buy them the time they needed to wait for Marius. When the Numidians saw Marius arrive with heavy reinforcements, they panicked, and instead of fighting for the part of the camp they'd already taken, they instead leapt down from the ramparts in order to try to run away, and in doing so, they incurred heavy losses as the Romans caught up to them and cut them down. The near fall of his camp on day one had Metellus spooked, and he was not willing to risk another attempt on the walls of Zama until he had located and defeated Jugurtha in the field. Therefore, on day two, rather than resuming his assault lines, Metellus instead set his men up to search for Jugurtha. He knew that Jugurtha must be lurking somewhere in the area, but he didn't know where, so Metellus's men were on patrol looking for the Numidian ruler. Jugurtha was able to actually sneak through a lot of the cavalry patrols and achieve surprise, but Metellus was then able to reconcentrate his forces and came close to overwhelming Jugurtha if Jugurtha had not interspersed infantry with his cavalrymen to give them more staying power. Jugurtha was then able to escape, although he did suffer some losses. 
Marius, in the meantime, seems to have been holding the reserve and was not directly involved with the fighting that Metellus was overseeing, and he noticed that the garrison of Zama was watching the battle on the plain intently, so intently that they weren't really paying attention to him. He was to their rear, so he decided to take his men with scaling ladders and try to take the city by a surprise assault, but while he and his men were running up to the walls, the garrison spotted him and then hurled down the ladders, resulting in many injuries. After this point, the Battle of Zama was effectively over, and the Romans had not achieved their objective. Nonetheless, Jugurtha's army and prestige were both badly battered. After two days of vicious fighting at Zama, Metellus and his men left for the Roman province in Africa and set up winter quarters near the border. From his camp, Metellus reverted to his original strategy of utilizing intrigue in order to turn some of Jugurtha's followers against him. From this time, Metellus was especially focused on Bomilcar, Jugurtha's chief general, who had a great deal of sway with the Numidian king. Bomilcar was persuaded by Metellus to go to Jugurtha and convince him that surrendering was his only option. Jugurtha, for his part, felt pretty beaten, and when he received this advice from one of his best friends and most trusted allies, he knew that he was doomed, so he agreed to surrender to Metellus. However, after he had handed over a great deal of wealth and was on the verge of handing over everything else, he had a sudden change of heart and decided that he must fight on. After this, Jugurtha looked a little unsteady and unstable, so it undermined his credibility, not to mention lessened his ability to pay his men, and Metellus was then able to crank up the dial of pressure on the people around Jugurtha to assassinate and overthrow him. Bomilcar, once again, was the senior guy Metellus was working on, but he also found two other senior officers who were willing to plot against their king. In time, perhaps a little bit after Metellus' tenure as commander ended, this would-be coup was discovered and Jugurtha had all three men put to death. The exact chronology of this is not entirely clear, but it seems that it took a while and that Metellus was already gone when the plot was finally discovered and put to rest. In the meantime, the Senate sent news to Metellus that he was to remain in Numidia as proconsul to conduct the war. By all appearances, Metellus had every reason to be confident that he would be able to finish the war completely in 108 and return home to Rome having accomplished his mission and having added Numidia to Rome's territories. Now, the Romans at this time seem to have officially been working on behalf of the ousted princes, but for all practical intents and purposes, if they had sacrificed this much blood and treasure on Numidia, most likely there would be some kind of agreement where it would be the kingdom would be willed to the Romans or they would annex some major chunk of it. So Metellus would be a conquering hero and all would be well. Metellus was clearly a gifted negotiator since he had kept Jugurtha in the dark about his intentions and was using his own envoys to build a plot against the king. However, it would appear that Metellus also had some political blind spots and also had some flaws in his character which previous events had not revealed. While the Romans were in winter camp, Gaius Marius thought that he had done enough to warrant a consular run, so he approached Metellus and asked his blessing to go to Rome in order to seek the consulship. Given how vital he had been to the war effort up to this point, one might think that Metellus would give him his blessing, even if Metellus as an aristocrat may have had some reservations about new men, certainly his good friend Gaius Marius, who was in the process of helping him win a cognomen and a great deal of fame, would make an exception. However, Metellus, despite having always been a good and generous friend up to that point, showed his aristocratic hauteur and dismissively suggested that Marius should wait until his 20-year-old son was eligible before running. <laughs> 
He thought perhaps maybe Marius and his son could be colleagues or back-to-back -back consuls. This was a great insult, and it showed that Metellus was ultimately hoping that Marius would never be consul, that in some way he must be unclean or unworthy simply because of his birth. Marius, for his part, knew that he was every bit as capable, if not more so, than any of his higher-born colleagues. He had proven this time and time again on campaign. As Sallust puts it, Now, Metellus, though richly endowed with many of the qualities that a good citizen should wish to possess, such as courage and the love of honor, had the usual failing of the aristocrat, a haughty and disdainful spirit. Marius continued to press his chief for permission to go back to Rome, and Metellus does not seem to have understood that this was important to Marius and that Marius would take it very poorly. He did not seem to realize that Marius, who in his opinion was low-born, had a strong sense of honor. He even suggested that not all favors and not all offices were suitable to all men one of his more famous quotes, something that later Romans would cite as a reason for holding others in contempt. Although ironically, it was just these words, just this contemptuous tone, which made an enemy of Gaius Marius. Marius would go on to be the deadliest and most vital enemy that Metellus had ever faced, as we'll see. Marius' honor was trampled upon, and for the rest of their respective lives, these two former friends would be the bitterest of political foes due to what happened in winter camp in Numidia over the, over the winter season of 109 to 108 BCE. Thoroughly disaffected with Metellus, Marius began to act like a politician in camp. Usually a fairly harsh disciplinarian, or at least a very stern one, Marius let discipline slide almost entirely in order to win popularity with the troops and perhaps win their votes, at least those of them who might be at home on leave when the election took place. Perhaps he also wanted to show Metellus that unless he got what he wanted, he was not going to do his duty to the best of his abilities. He also spoke to Gouda, one of the ineffectual relatives of Jugurtha, who happened to be in camp. Marius promised him that if he were the victorious commander of Roman forces, that he would make Gouda the new king of Numidia in place of Jugurtha. Writing to his political allies in Rome, Marius began the campaign in earnest and also firmly asserted the importance of his role in the previous year's fighting. Perhaps it was from these letters that Sallust even got his account of the battles in detail. And it's also, I suppose, possible that Marius inflated his role to some extent. At any rate, we know from later experience with Marius that his abilities in the military arena were pretty unrivaled, especially when he was still in his prime. Eventually, Metellus grew sick of dealing with Marius's lower class antics and consented to send him to Rome in order to run for office. Metellus felt that because of Marius's lack of name recognition and rather underwhelming pedigree that he most likely would be rejected by the voters and come back hat in hand, ready to serve proudly under the grand banner of the Caecilius Metellus name. Metellus was wrong. Metellus had been dealing pretty successfully with Jugurtha diplomatically while also losing a political fight in his own camp against Marius. However, all of these great men were not the only players in the game. The locals at Vaga, who were loyal Numidians, felt that perhaps they had in some ways dishonored themselves by allowing the Romans in so easily. They were beginning to have second thoughts about allowing the Romans to stay there, and so they revolted against the Roman garrison, taking them by surprise, and massacring all but one of the Roman station there. The only person to survive and escape the massacre at Vaga was the governor Terpilius. All of his men had their throats slit, but Terpilius, for whatever reason, was able to escape the city 
and returned to Marius' camp. Afterwards, he was completely disgraced by the affair, and Metellus held him in the lowest regard. Upon hearing the news of what had happened at Vaga, Metellus briefly shut himself in his quarters to grieve, perhaps thinking that had he been paying more attention to the garrison at Vaga, that this massacre would have never taken place. Then, after he had had time to cry for his lost soldiers, he led his army out without baggage in order to march as quickly as possible and arrive at Vaga to take the, garris, the uh, locals by surprise. The locals, however, were on high alert. So what Metellus did is he hired some of his Numidian auxiliaries to go as his advance guard in order to trick the locals into thinking that they were opening the gates to King Jugurtha. Now that the gates were open, the Romans appeared and then massacred the city. Not only did they kill all the inhabitants, they also burned the city to the ground. Terpilius, who was not a Roman citizen, he must have been a wealthy Latin, was executed after a brief court-martial before Metellus and his legates. The soldiers at Vaga, who had had their throats slit by the people they were supposed to be protecting, had been avenged in full, and in the most Roman of ways. Back in Rome, Marius was able to convince a large number of people of the truth of his story of the war in Numidia. Many of the common people and also some of the wealthy equestrians who had political ambitions or entertained ambitions for their children were won over by his new man story of being a man of great ability who was being artificially held back by an arrogant aristocrat who felt entitled to hold offices because of his birth and did not see Marius as his equal despite proving it over and over and over. The reason I emphasize that many of the wealthier equestrians and some of the poorer senators may have been big Marius fans is because in order to win a consular election you had to win some of the first 18 tribes which were typically composed of fairly well-to-do individuals. The last 17 tribes were basically the poor and since a majority was formed when you had 18 tribes vote for you out of the 35, this means that you always had to have some support among the well-to-do in society. So Marius' story resonated not just with the commoners, as Plutarch would have you believe, but with a fairly decent section of the Roman public. Marius, despite being unpopular in the Senate, was able to win the election handily, and then used the popular assembly to get the command in Numidia reassigned from Metellus to himself. This was something which would have really outraged the Senate since this was allowed and it was a procedure that people had done in the past. However, it was considered irregular and beneath the dignity of the Roman Senate to have the people make decisions of this significance. When he received the news of how foolish he had been to allow Marius to go to Rome, Metellus wept in his tent and then refused to hand over the army in person to Marius, leaving that task to a subordinate. Metellus felt that when he returned to Rome, he would be an object of scorn. Surely the people there had rejected him if they not only had elected this fool Gaius Marius, but then taken away his command and given it to that same fool. Metellus must have been quite nervous as he sailed back to Rome. However, when he returned, he found his friends and political allies waiting for him, and they gave him a raucous reception. He was treated as a returning hero. The Senate welcomed him back with open arms, voting for him to receive a triumph and the cognomen Numidicus for his efforts. Sure, he had not brought the war in Numidia to a close, and that war was still going on. However, the Senate had decided that Marius had stepped outside of the bounds of decency, and that Metellus had been robbed of what would have been a surefire victory. Far from living in shame, Numidicus was now the most prestigious he had ever been in his life. He was both the leader of the aristocratic faction for the rest of his life, whether he wanted to be or not, as we'll see, 
and also the Senate's leading and most prestigious voice opposed to Marius. After he won the Juggerthene War, Marius's prestige was such that he was the undisputed number one guy in Rome. After that, Numidicus had a pretty good claim to be number two, although the rising star, the young Sulla, was a close contender. In 102, after several years of trying unsuccessfully to slow down Marius, Numidicus was elected censor along with his cousin and close political ally, Gaius Caecilius Metellus Caprarius, and the two of them decided to try to get rid of Marius's chief supporters, the junior officials who would go before these assemblies and get Marius all the best and juiciest commands. Their goal was to expel them on procedural grounds using the census, and they did manage to get rid of some people who they felt were problematic. One person who I've argued in the past was a victim of the two Metellii was Gaius Norbanus, who later served as consul in the 80s. However, when it came to the two biggest proponents of Marius, Saturninus and Glaucia, the two Metellii censors only managed to antagonize them and ensure that they would be out for revenge. Saturninus and Glaucia then became even more devoted to Marius's cause and, more to the point, to harming the career of Metellus Numidicus by all means possible. Saturninus especially seems to have had a personal hatred for Numidicus, whereas it appears that Metellus Caprarius had mostly focused his attacks on Glaucia. So uh, Saturninus, who was one of the best known orators and tribunes of the time, had a vendetta against Numidicus, and this would present a huge problem for the senior statesman. In the year 100, Marius served as consul for the sixth time, the fifth consecutive consulship for him, but it was the first time that he had primarily resided in Rome, and also the first time when he would be dealing with domestic affairs. All of his prior consulships had been effectively wartime, dealing with Numidia and then dealing with the Gallic threat in northern Italy. Marius was not a very good politician, so this was the time when he might run into trouble and when Metellus Numidicus and others might finally cut him down a peg. Saturninus was serving as tribune for, I believe it was the third time in a row, and he decided to move an agrarian bill granting land to Marius's veterans, and he required that all senators swear an oath to uphold it on pain of being expelled from the Senate. However, Numidicus refused because he thought that this was bad public policy and would set an evil precedent. Rather than take the oath and do harm, Numidicus uniquely and by himself refused and then resigned from the Senate. However, Saturninus was not satisfied by Metellus's concession and he moved to formally banish him. Numidicus's allies thought this was an absolute outrage and they promised the former censor that they would fight in the streets for his right to remain in Rome. However, he told them that it wasn't worth it and packed his bags and went to Rhodes where he continued his study of philosophy that same study that he had started as a young man under Carneades in Athens. He would spend the next couple of years in Rhodes, and while you might think that this would have been a depressing time in his life, there's no real evidence that he was all that put out by his political misfortune. Perhaps he had gotten too old and uninterested in politics for such a thing to really bother him. Maybe he felt that the future belonged to the Mariuses and Saturninuses of the world, and that the Rome that he had known and loved was effectively gone. It's really unclear, but at any rate, he would spend the next few years away in Rhodes. Marius's consulship had ended in something of a disaster when the Senate voted the SCU and then asked him to deal with Saturninus, who had gotten out of control and had strayed away from Marius's direction. Saturninus had pissed off Marius by really straying from working for Marius's interest, and Marius, although reluctantly, decided to kill his 
best political ally. Without Saturninus to guide him, Marius was a fish out of water when it came to Roman politics, and he was outmaneuvered. He lost his re-election bid, and he would remain politically irrelevant until the outbreak of the Social War in 91. Meanwhile, Numidicus's young son, Metellus, was campaigning tirelessly for his father's return, and did so with such vigor that he earned the cognomen Pius, which means someone who loves his father or family. After Saturninus was killed, another tribune began to advance a bill to recall Numidicus, and of course, young Metellus Pius was one of the leading voices on that bill. When he eventually did return in 99, Numidicus lacked his old flair for politics. He rarely entered the forum or participated in public life. Now, in theory and in spirit, he was still kind of the embodiment of the aristocrat, and he was kind of the living legend of that particular political outlook. That being said, it would appear that Numidicus himself had lost a lot of interest in really uh, taking an active role in politics. I suppose he would oblige people who wanted to talk politics and came over to his house, but he seems to have really wanted to be left alone. Maybe he was busy studying philosophy, or maybe he was suffering from ill health. It's really not clear. He lived until 91, when Cicero reported that he had been murdered by the tribune Quintus Varius of Varian Law fame. However, Quintus Varius had proven to be a traitor to the Roman cause by being too favorable to the Italians right before their revolt, so any smear against someone like that would be given a little too much credence, and Cicero liked to believe the worst about people he considered to be demagogues. That being said, there would really be no reason to kill the elderly Metellus Numidicus, since by this point he was largely unofficially retired and wasn't really pulling too many strings. So most likely he just died of illness or old age at this time. If I'm correct about his age, this would put him at about 60 years old. If the traditional dating is right, then he would actually be closer to 70. However, that does not mean that even at 60, if my dating is correct, that he would have been healthy and vigorous. Let us now consider the impact and legacy of Quintus Caecilius Metellus Numidicus's life. Numidicus's conduct during the Juggerthene War was critical to the eventual resolution of that conflict. Granted, it did not require military genius to win the war in Numidia, however, it did require a Roman who was committed to achieving the policy goals of the Roman Senate and people rather than the less honorable goal of lining one's own pockets with the wealth of the king of Numidia. The main thing that we associate Metellus Numidicus with, and rightly so, is his key role in Marius's life. Metellus and his relatives were critical to the rise of Marius. They provided him with opportunities as a legate and supported his political ambitions at least up to the praetorship. Getting him to that point then meant really unlocking a lot of Marius's ambitions, and especially after his successes in Numidia, Marius felt that he was worthy of the consulship. However, Metellus then managed to alienate him, and it was only at that point when Marius went full popularis, as it would later be called, and decided to defy the Senate and work through the assemblies. Without that key breakdown between Metellus and Marius in the winter of 109 to 108, one has to wonder what Marius' career would have looked like. Most likely, he would have still felt that he had a strong connection with the Senate and that he didn't need to resort to such measures to get commands. It's also unlikely that he would have inherited the war in Numidia won military fame and then been the darling of the people who was seen as a savior figure and then had carte blanche to reform the Roman military from the bottom up, making it a professional army and also saving Rome from the Gallic menace.
Metellus' role in all of this would be, from his own perspective, very negative, and I imagine that this may have played a role in his eventual disillusionment with politics. That being said, in his own time, Metellus Numidicus was something of a hero to those around him. He was an excellent orator and a man of aristocratic virtue. He was considered a moral exemplar by men who shared his views, and the later generation, men like Cicero, who may have only known Numidicus by name or perhaps seen him while they were teenagers, considered him to be an example worth following. That is reflected in the fact that a number of Metellus's quotes have been preserved down to the present. The line that he used on Marius to try to dissuade him from running for consul, for instance, is one of the better known lines of any Roman politician. He said, quote, do not imagine that all aspirations are proper to all men. Be content with your lot and do not ask of the Roman people a favor which they would have every right to refuse you. Other Metellus quotes have become memes on the internet today. The one on your screen says, anyone can do the right thing when there is no danger attached. What distinguishes the good man from others is that when danger is involved, he still does right. This is in the context of Metellus refusing to sign Saturninus's pledge and accepting exile rather than doing what he considers to be an unjust action. That is all I have to say about Metellus Numidicus. I'm Thersites the Historian, and I will see you soon with a video on Metellus Numidicus's son, Metellus Pius.